Hey guys, um, welcome to Geology, uh, Glaciology, and Historical Location of the Great Divide Trail. Um, I'm Meg, I'm just going to be your host for the evening, uh, but Connor is going to do all of the educating. Um, and we're really excited to be here and to present this for you. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So we're just going to start with a land acknowledgement. The Great Divide Trail Association is committed to reconciliation, which starts by taking this and every opportunity to acknowledge our honor and privilege to live, work, and play within the Treaty 7 territory. Our honor, we honor and acknowledge that the GDT passes through traditional Indigenous territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Stony, Nakota, uh, Sutina, Cree, Schwapnik, um, Lately, Tene, Tanaha, Sinix and Métis. The Great Divide Trail Association would like to invite you to advocate for what you love and preserve nature for future generations to enjoy while educating yourself and others on Indigenous history and perspectives. Next slide. All right, so this is just a little bit about who we are as the Great Divide Trail Association. We're a volunteer-based organization, um, so that we're also a nonprofit. We only have one, um, paid member, so we only have one employee, and the rest of us are volunteers. Um, and we are uh, hundreds of kilometers of trail building we've done, and we advocate on behalf of Canada's longest hiking trail. And so kind of how you can help the association is, our biggest thing is memberships. Uh, becoming a member will help us be able to apply for grants and just show that we have the support of people behind us. You can also volunteer. Uh, we always have trail building um, volunteer opportunities and a lot of other ways to volunteer. And you can also donate. Uh, we do take donations on our website. And next slide. And so we just wanna talk about a few upcoming events. Um, so the first one is our film festival. It's going to be next Thursday in Calgary. Um, from 6.30 to 9.30 on April 11th. It's at the Globe Cinema. And we also have an at-home option. So when you buy tickets, you can always buy tickets just to watch the films at home. And then, so that's April 11th. And then we have our Gear Trade garage sale. So it's going to be at Gear Trade, which is in Okotok, uh, May 11th at 10 to 10 a.m. to 3. And you can bring your gear. We're going to do a gear swap. Um, gear trade and yeah it's going to be a really fun event um, so May 11th for that and if you want any more information on any more um, events or coming up with the Great Divide Trail Association you can always check out on our website greatdividetrailassociation.com um, and it will be under the get involved tab all right Connor I will give it to you all right thanks Megan so I'm just going to start with an intro slide about myself. So of course I'm including this pretty picture uh, from Wilcox Pass in Jasper National Park overlooking the Columbia ice fields, but it's born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta. So I'm a local Alburn that's gone to the Rockies consistently throughout their whole life. And I received both a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Geology from the University of Alberta, also located in Edmonton, Alberta. And with my frequent travel to the Rockies, that includes hiking, backpacking, skiing, and basically in every single location of the Rockies, Banff, Canmore, Yathra, Waterton, Grossmouth Pass, everywhere in between. And just to give you some more examples that I have been to areas close to the Great Divide Trail. This was me skiing last spring at Sunshine Village. And you can see Mount Assiniboine off in the distance, this triangular shaped peak. And the Great Divide Trail in this photo is actually below the clouds here. So sadly, you can't see it. Uh, this next picture, this was me on the Sawback Trail last year. This is a hiking, uh, sorry, backpacking trail that connects Lake Louise Ski Hill to Mount Norquay. So Lake Louise to the town of Banff. And this was up in Pulsatil Pass. I laid out a bunch of gear to dry it off because it poured rain the whole night. And I thought it'd be funny to take a picture of myself napping up on the pass. And then this should be a really recognizable one because it's right on the Great Divide Trail. This is Flow Lake on the Rockwall Trail, and the day I went here, I just did this as a day hike. However, the weather was quite miserable. It was raining basically the whole time, and when we actually got up to Flow Lake, it was snowing up there. So as you can see, I was wearing my rain jacket just to try and prevent any water from getting on me, but it's a beautiful location, and if you've done the Great Divide Trail or are planning on doing it, you'll love Flow Lake. 
Now to get on with the actual presentation, why is it called the Great Divide Trail? Well, that's because the Great Divide Trail follows the hydrological divide along the peaks of the Southern Canadian Rockies. And this map I included on the right, it's an older map of the Great Divide Trail. There are differences with the actual trail itself now, which is the red line on this map. But the reason I like this map is it also includes the border between Alberta and British Columbia, which is where the divide is actually located. And what this divide is, is just based on which way water flows. So if you're on the west side of this line, water on this side is generally flowing in this direction towards the Pacific, but water on this side is generally flowing this direction. So eastwards, either to Hudson's Bay or the Arctic Ocean. And the next slide just shows the different drainage regions throughout Canada. And the ones that the Great Divide Trail specifically interacts with is number four, number two, number six, number 10, and number 11. So four is the Columbia River. This starts in the Rockies, drains out into the Pacific Ocean in between Washington and Oregon State. Two is the Fraser River that drains out into the ocean at Vancouver. Six, this is the Peace and Athabasca. If I remember correctly, it's only the Athabasca that the Great Divide Trail actually interacts with. However, uh, this eventually drains up into the Arctic Ocean through the Mackenzie River drainage basin all the way up here. Then 11 is the South, South Saskatchewan drainage basin. That includes the Bow River, which goes through Calgary, the Old Man River, and the Red Deer River. And 10 is the North Saskatchewan River, and that's the one that goes through Edmonton, starts in Banff National Park at Saskatchewan Glacier. And both 10 and 11 end up going into Hudson's Bay through the Nelson River, which is number 14. Now to get started on the geology, it's composed, the Rockies are composed mainly of sedimentary rocks of the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, and they range in age from Mesoproterozoic to Cretaceous in age. Now this image on the right here is the geologic time scale. So I'm just going to highlight the maximum and the youngest age. So maximum age, if you go over here on the right side, is Mesoproterozoic. And if you look at these numbers right here, this is the age in millions of years ago, which is represented by MA right here. So the Mesoproterozoic is from 1,600 million years ago to 1,000 million years ago. Or another way of putting that is 1.6 to 1 billion years ago was the Mesoproterozoic. Then the younger age range is the Cretaceous, which this is a relatively well-known and famous uh, geologic period due to di dinosaurs being very prevalent at this time. So the Cretaceous ranges from 145, located down here, to 66 million years ago. And that number 66 is important, and some of you may recognize it as this is when dinosaurs went extinct. And that's actually what classifies the end of the Cre Cretaceous as the mass extinction event that occurred at 66 million years, old, years ago. Now, there are minor igneous and metamorphic rocks in the Canadian Rockies. However, I'm not really going to discuss them as they're just in such low, low volume that the majority of the rocks you're going to encounter are sedimentary, unless you're in very specific areas. So just to show you where the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin is, it's this green area that I've highlighted here. The other colors are just other sedimentary basins within Canada, but the Canadian Rockies are actually located on the western edge of this basin, right about here. So how the Canadian Rockies form? Well, the rocks that compose these mountains were deposited horizontally in ancient marine environments, and there's generally two types of rocks, clastic and carbonate rocks. So clastic rocks are just rocks that form from broken pieces of older rocks. Carbonate rocks forms from minerals with a carbonate ion, which is just carbon and three oxygen. Now I'll get into what kind of rocks are clastic and carbonate, but first I wanna show you what I mean by ancient marine environments. So this was Earth during the Cambrian period, specifically at 514 million years ago. I want you to focus on this continent in the middle here, Laurentia. Laurentia is just another name for North America. And this white line is actually, you can see the modern day outline of North America. So if you look on the Western edge of what is now the Western edge of North America, which you can see British Columbia approximately here, this would be the ancient marine environment where the Rockies were, I mean, sediments initially get deposited. Now, for classic rocks, an example I'll give you for that is sandstone. So stand, sandstone is typically composed of the mineral quartz, which quartz is quite resistant to weathering and erosion. However, it will get weathered over time. And what happens is quartz will get broken down to the size of a grain of sand. So imagine yourself on a beach and you're walking along the beach on the ocean, ripple marks on your feet. Well, there might be one piece of sand in there. And while it's sitting there, as you walk over it, some more sand will bury it and then some more sand will bury it and more sand will bury it. And over time, the pressure and overlying weight from the other sediments cause all these sand grains to cement together, creating a sandstone. 
And an example of a carbonate rock would be limestone, which is also a common rock in the Canadian Rockies. And limestone can form in many ways, but the example I'm going to give is specifically coral reefs. So coral is a living organism and they make these hard exoskeletons made out of calcium carbonate. So let's say a piece of coral, uh, the coral skeleton breaks off, falls to the ocean floor. And then we have that again, another piece falls off, falls to the ocean floor. And over time works the same way, all these overlying coral pieces will bury the ones underneath. And then because of the overlying pressure, they'll cement together, creating a limestone. And in that example I'm giving as well, it will also form fossils, specifically coral fossils. Now, after these rocks were deposited, they were then pushed east and upwards in orogeny that built the Canadian Rockies. And orogeny is just a fancy term for mountain building. And what specifically pushed these upwards into the east were thrust faults. And thrust faults are just, there's three kinds of faults. There's strike slip, which is the, a famous example of that is the San Andreas fault, where if you're looking at it from above, the faults slide past each other like this. Normal faults, where if you're looking at it from staying straight on, the one wall, which is called the foot wall, moves upwards relative to the other wall, which is the hanging wall. And a reverse fault, which is where the hanging wall moves upwards relative to the foot wall. And a thrust fault is just a low angle reverse fault. And by definition, it's less than or equal to 45 degrees dip. And there's two current thoughts for what causes serogeny. One is a microcontinent, which is basically everything that's making up British Columbia currently slammed into the side of North America, causing all these rocks to move, or multiple island arc chains slammed into the side of North America at different times, also causing these rocks to move to the east. Now, the rocks that make up the Canadian Rockies are divided into ranges, and the largest subdivision of these ranges are the foothills, front ranges, main ranges, and back ranges. And I'll get into these a bit later, but first I want to play this computer model showing how this mountain building may have occurred. So focus on this middle part right here, as you can see what would be sedimentary layers here in these lines. So as you can see, the mountain building starts in the, this would be the west and occurs. Then what you see here is a thrust fault. Thrust fault, that's increasing the elevation as well, as you can see the rocks move upwards. They don't give exact elevation just because this is a computer model, but they give relative difference from zero. So five, that's thrust fault here, more thrust faults over here. And what's interesting with thrust faults is it brings older rocks above younger rocks. So typically rocks, when they're deposited, they're deposited originally horizontal with, and it will continue, oldest rocks in the bottom, youngest rocks move upwards. Now, to give you an idea of when these thrust faults occurred, these are age dates from the Alberta Geologic Survey. And this is from a map of the Canadian Rockies just in Alberta, uh, sorry, geologic map of the Canadian Rockies just in Alberta. So. I can show this map after the presentation. It was a very large file, so I couldn't include it in the presentation. But how these ages over here were found was from Argon 40, Argon 39 to age dating, which how that works is they take the isotope ratio of Argon 40 to Argon 39, and then you can use it to estimate an age. And that's based on the radioactive decay of potassium 40 to Argon 40. So if you ate a banana today, you Potassium-40 is a naturally occurring radioactive element, and it's there's different isotopes of potassium. However, if you ate a banana because of high in potassium, you, you most likely ingested some potassium-40, so you'll likely have some radioactive elements in you. But to get to the age dates themselves, the oldest age date is a pyramid, sorry, pyramid thrust fault at 158 million years old, located right here. Well, the youngest thrust fault is the Lewis thrust fault at 51 million years old, located right here. So we have approximately 100 million years of mountain building in the Alberta Rockies. Now, if we included thrust faults in British Columbia, we would get at different age dates. But because this is just from the Alberta Geologic Survey, they only included the Rockies in Alberta. Now, this is section C of the Great Divide Trail. This is just a Google Earth image, that screen cap I took. So the red line, this is the Great Divide Trail, starts down here at Canasks Lakes, works its way up, goes by the Rockwall Trail, Mount Assiniboine, it's all the way up the field. The reason I included this image is it really highlights the mountain ranges well. So the biggest division would be the front ranges, which you can see right here, the main ranges, which are the highest peaks, which the Great Divide Trail follows such as the Rockwall Trail right here, that's in the main ranges, and the specific range it follows is the Vermilion Range, then the back ranges we can see right next to Rocky Mountain Trench. Now, 
the range, the front, back, and main ranges also have individual ranges in them, such as the Rundle range, which you can see right here, Sawback range, Vermillion range I mentioned. However, that's how they form. There are slight differences, but geologically, but it's mostly geographic separation because humans like to categorize things. Now, just to give you a brief introduction on the front ranges and the main ranges, I'm gonna actually bring you to the start of the Rockies in the front ranges, which is at least on Highway 1, the Trans-Canada Highway, which is Mount Yamneska. So Mount Yamneska was formed by the McConnell Thrust, which is located approximately here. And the rock on top is called the Eldon Formation, and it's a carbonate unit. It's Cambrian in age, so 538 to 485 million years old. But the rock underneath is the Belly River Formation, and this is Cretaceous in age. So it's 145 to 66 million years old, and it's composed of sandstone. Now, Mount Yamneska is great because you can see the contrast between the different uh, lithologies, such as the carbonates forming this really nice cliff versus the sandstone where it's covered by grass and forest. But what's also interesting too is the Sluss Fault also shows the age difference. So the Elm Formation was Cambrian, the Belly River was Cretaceous, so that's approximately 500 to 400 million years difference between, the two, between these two units with the older rock on top. Now the start of the main ranges on the trans Highway is Castle Mountain. So Castle Mountain was created by the Castle Mountain Thrust, which is located approximately here. And the main ranges are important because this is where the Great Divide Trail is mostly located because the main ranges are also where the highest peaks are located. So this is where the divide falls. And this includes peaks such as Mount Robson, Flow Peak, no, Cinnaboyne, the Rock Wall, and it's also the location of most of the ice fields, such as the largest ones, such as the Columbia. Now, the formations on top of Castle Mountain are the Eldon, Stephen, Cathedral, Mount White, Gog Group, and Miette Group. Now, from the Eldon all the way to the Gog Group, those are Cambrian in age. And what's interesting, too, is we're having the Eldon formation occur again here, as it did in Mount Yamneska. Well, the Miette Group is Neoproterozoic in age. But what's interesting is thrust fall. So its picture's a bit blurry, but there's a little outcrop occurring right here. Well, that's the Eldon formation. So the Castle Mountain Thrust is bringing the Elden Formation above the Elden Formation. However, it's including many of the rock units that are older than the Elden Formation underlying it. So it's amazing the forces that occur to create these mountains. So why are the Rockies so rocky? Well, there's two main reasons. One, differential erosion. So harder rocks erode softer, erode less than softer rocks. And the second reason, Glaciers. So this photo, this is the Athabasca Glacier taken from the Columbia ice fields. And glaciers are very powerful erosive forces because it's tons and tons of ice that just carve away these rocks. You can see the bare rock here. You can see the moraine, which is just piles of rocks deposited by the glacier. And I'm just going to play, play a quick animation from Ben Gad, who's a retired geologist. This was taken from his website. If you just Google Ben Gad, you'll be able to find it. And on the website, it does have narration by Jerry Alt. However, I'm just going to narrate it. Oh, sorry. Skip to the next slide. So I played it. So this is a computer model, but this is approximately 15 million years ago. And this is in the location of Canmore. So as you can see here, the present day site of Canmore was more similar to a high elevation plateau at 12,000 feet. And it'd probably be similar day, today to modern day Tibet. And over time, as time's going by, that starts eroding. And as you can see, the green is eroding quicker than the harder rocks he here on the left and the right. So as you can see, lower elevation, approximately 4 million years ago, the harder rocks, which are more resistant to erosion, stay at a higher elevation. Now this is representing an ice age. So a large glacier came through the Bow Valley and carved away a lot of the rock, creating this large U-shaped valley. So this is present day. Now the animation continues into what may happen in the future and without any further glaciations, but the rocks will continue to erode and continue to decrease in elevation with the softer rocks eroding faster than the harder rocks due to differential erosion. And as this continues, the mountains will get lower in elevation and will get closer to sea level until they'll say it at the close to the end of this animation, but they'll resemble more like that bullet the Appalachian Mountains located in the Eastern United States and Eastern Canada. You see, 
elevations getting closer and closer and closer to sea level. So glaciers are very powerful erosive forces. And at the last glacial maximum, which was about 26,000 to 20,000 years ago, basically all of Canada was covered by glaciers. Only a little part of the Yukon wasn't covered up here, but most of Canada was covered by the Laurentide ice sheet. However, the Rockies were covered by the Cordilleran ice sheet. And this really eroded away the Rockies into the rocky peaks we see today. Now I'm gonna get into some glacial landforms. So hopefully, after this, you'll be able to recognize these next time you're on trail in the Canadian Rockies or on the Great Divide Trail. I'm going to start with the largest, which is ice fields. So the example I'm showing here is the Columbia Ice Field, which you can clearly see right here. You can see it's Outlet Glacier, some of the tall peaks such as Mount Columbia, the Twin, Mount Alberta. So these are very large features, large square area. And there's other ice fields in the Canadian Rockies, such as the Watta, the Wattic, Java Reef Ice Field. Now, most of them do occur along the divide in the main ranges. However, there are some farther east. Next largest feature are valley glaciers. So the example I'm showing here is the Athabasca Glacier. And this is one of the outlet glaciers of the Columbia Icefield. This is the most visited glacier in the Canadian Rockies, as this is where the snow coaches are located. And you can see one here. They look tiny relative to the glacier. Another one here, another one leaving the glacier, driving up the road. And this is a good example of a valley glacier because it's confined to this valley with steep walls. So you can see the steep cliffs over here, steep cliffs over here, forcing the glacier to come out the valley this way. Now, another example of a valley glacier that's just closer to the Great Divide Trail is the Robson Glacier. And this is coming off Mount Robson, where it's just, the peak is just off the photograph over here. However, the Robson Glacier is coming this way. And it's also confined by steep walls again, so, which you can see in the cliff right here. Next example of the glacier I'm showing you is a cirque glacier, which cirque glaciers form in bowl-shaped depressions and they create bowl-shaped depressions themselves. So this is Mount Assiniboine, just off the Great Divide Trail. And this right here would be a cirque glacier. So it's sort of hard to see because the hut's in the way, but it forms a bowl shape roughly like this. And there's another glacier off to the side here. I mean, you can just see only the top of it as well, but this is another cirque glacier forming a bowl like this. Now, the next example is a hanging glacier, and the example I'm showing in this photo is Angel Glacier in Jasper National Park, as it's a beautiful example, and probably the well, most well-known hanging glacier in the Canadian Rockies. And this is the hanging glacier itself part right here. However, the glacier that's feeding is actually Cirque Glacier, and you can see the bowl-shaped depression quite a bit better here, where it follows the rock. Now, sadly, this glacier is retreating a lot, so most likely won't be hanging glacier much longer, as it used to come a lot farther down and from this cliff. However, I'll show you another example of a hanging glacier that's on the Great Divide Trail, and this is Tumbling Glacier. So as you can see up here, here's a hanging glacier cascading down this cliff, and then there's another one right here cascading down this cliff, feeding into the main glacier. Now, U-shaped valleys are probably going to be the most common glacial landform you'll rec see on the Great Divide Trail, as basically every valley in the Canadian Rockies is a U-shaped valley. Glaciers flo were flowing through this at one point. So the U-shape is a approximately like this. And in this photo, a valley glacier, which is outlined in this red, would have created this U-shape by carving away the rocks on the side. And it either would have been flowing away that way or flowing towards us in this photo. Now, hanging valleys, this forms when a large glacier, which would be in this valley down here, which in front of the cliffs. And the example I'm using here is Tequaca Falls in Yoho National Park. This is a beautiful example of a hanging valley. So a large glacier either would have flowing to the left or right in this photo, and a secondary glacier would have fed into this large glacier from up here. Now, during the last glacial maximum, the large main glacier would have reached all the way up here, or the glacier here would have just gone into the side of the main glacier. However, once the glaciers melted away at the end of the last ice age, well, the main glacier melted away, but we still, and this glacier up here also melted away, the secondary glacier. However, we have the valley remaining here. And to this day, there is a glacier up here and it's feeding Tequaco Falls, but that's what also helps highlight this as a hanging valley is the waterfall themselves. Now moraines, these are just glacial deposits. So there's multiple types of moraines. The photo here is Tumbling Glacier and the moraines are just piles of rock, silt, dirt, sand that are deposited by the glaciers on either the side, in the middle or the fronts of the glaciers. So the example right here of the pile of rocks, this is known as a lateral, lateral moraine because it's on the side of the glacier. 
the terminal moraine is at the end of the glacier, so it would have been at the right about here is the terminal moraine. Sorry, it's a bit hard to see as it's far away because that's where the glacier would have advanced last before it started retreating. Then the last example is a medial moraine, which I'm showing here. This is Dome Glacier right here, feeding this way. However, it interacts and meets up with this glacier as well. And this band of rocks in the middle is actually the medial moraine. And also what's interesting in this photo is Dome Peak, which is located right up here, is actually the triple point of the divide. So this is actually what separates the drainage basin between the Pacific Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and Hudson's Bay. So this is a very important point for the border and the Great Divide Trail. Now, pyramidal peaks or glacial horns, they're the same thing. This is just when peaks form uh, in a roughly pyramid shape due to cirt glaciers carving away at the side of the mountain. So as you can see, here's a cirt glacier right here and mountain avoids this triangular peak. And another famous example of this would be the Matterhorn in the European Alps. Now, just go over what I've discussed. This is a glacial diagram where a glacier is actually here. So we have this large main glacier creating the U-shaped valley. We have cirque glaciers feeding into the main glacier. So that could possibly create a hanging valley. We have a horn located over here. Rhett's just a ridge of mountain peaks in between glaciers. Then they also show an example of a medial moraine. Then after the glacier melts away, this is what's left. So hanging valley, they have a waterfall here, which would example of that would be Tequaka Falls. We have a cirque, which is just a bowl-shaped depression. It's still called a cirque after the glacier melts away. Horn, and we have the U-shaped valley. Now, I'm going to get into specific areas along the Great Divide Trail and discuss the geology here. And I'm going to start with Section A in Waterton National Park, because these are where the oldest rocks of the Great Divide Trail are located. And these rocks are composed of the Purcell Supergroup, which are Mesoproterozoic in age, so 1.6 to 1 billion years old. And the rocks specifically here are approximately 1.5 billion years old. Now, many of the rocks in this area have a bright red color, which you can see in this photo on the right here of Carthew Lakes. And this is simply just due to iron. So these rocks have a lot of iron in them. And when iron rusts, it turns into a red to orangey color. So this is simply just rusty iron within these rocks. Another interesting thing about the rocks in Martin National Park is some of the oldest fossils on the planet are found here. And these fossils are known as stromatolites. So sorry about this photo being very blurry, but there's layers you can see here in roughly a curved shape. And how these layers form is blue-green algae, also known as cyanobacteria, were living in an ocean environment. And as they were sitting there, the waves would wash over, sediment would get deposited on top of this bacteria. So they bury their way on top of this sediment and then trap the sediment underneath. And this occurs multiple times, creating all these different layers. Now, we have stromatolites still on Earth to this day. And this is the example here from Shark Bay, Australia. So each of these mounds is just a cyanobacteria mound. And how these mounds grow is a wave will come in, or say the tide will come in, wash sediments over this, and the cyanobacteria grows on top of sediment, trapping the sediment underneath it. Now let's head to the Rockwall Trail. So the Rockwall Trail follows the Vermilion Range, which is composed of the Otter Tail Formation and is made of limestone, which another name for this is also the Otter Tail Limestone. So all the famous peaks and the whole range as you're walking along this is the Otter Tail Limestone. That includes the Flow Peak, which is in this picture right here, the Rockwall itself, and the Otter Tail Formation is Cambrian in age, which is 538 to 485 million years old. So now, next time you're on the Rockwall Trail or the Great Divide, you now know what rocks exactly compose these famous peaks you're seeing. Now, the Burgess Shale in Yoho National Park is probably the most famous geologic site in the Canadian Rockies, and it's located above the Quintanoc Alternate in Yoho National Park. And it's one of the world's most famous fossil deposits because it has soft body preservation. And the soft body, body preservation makes it known as a Lagerstein. So Lagerstein is just a German word that they use to describe exceptionally preserved fossils. And these fossils are specifically Cambrian in age. The image on the right here, this is just a uh, Walcott quarry, which got to take a guided tour to go up. But to give you an idea of how old these fossils are, this is the Burgess Shale fossils right here. They're about 508 million years old. This is when the first plants on land appeared, roughly 469 million years ago. And this is when the dinosaurs went extinct. So we have hundreds of millions of years between these famous Burgess Shale fossils and the extinction of the dinosaurs. So just to show you where the Walcott Quarry is, this orange line here is the Quintinoc alternate. Well, the Walcott Quarry is located just above it here. Now, 
if you want to take a short break, I'd highly recommend and look for fossils. I'd highly recommend on the quinoptic. Oh, I can't talk. The, on the alternates to stop here and dig around the fall the shale, which is located here, and you'll most likely find some fossils that have been swept down by avalanches. And what this shale looks like, it's this dark gray to this brown color, and shale is a mudstone that just forms in fissile layers. And shale is a very common sedimentary rock. However, the shale for the Burgess shale is a carbonate shale, so it will react with, if you have weak acid, say vinegar, it will cause it to fizz. But most shale is composed of silica, and it comes in a variety of colors, so black, gray, green, red, and there's actually place names named after shale in the Great Divide Trail, such as Big Shale Hill in Section G of the Great Divide Trail. Now I'm just going to show you a few of the fossils from the Burgess Shale. So this is Anomalo caris. This was a predatory animal that lived in the Cambrian. This is its tail over here. This is its head, and it had these appendages hanging off its face where it would pick up its prey and to eat it. So it's sort of hard to see just because this fossil is kind of smushed by the overlying sediment. However, this is an artist's reconstruction of what it may have looked like when it was living. They made it this pink color just because it was related to shrimp. Now, very common fossils are trilobites. And basically, if you see a trilobite fossil, you're automatically in the Paleozoic on the geologic time scale. But this trilobite specifically is the genus Ogeogopus, I believe is how you pronounce it. And this is what it looks like. So the head's here, body here, tail here. And this is what it may have looked like when it was living. So it had these little antennas, it had its eyes, and it crawled around on the ocean floor. Now, the last fossil I'm going to show you is a Odioa fossil, because this is why the Burgess Shale is called a Lagerstein. It's because it has soft body preservation. So Odioa was a soft body worm that buried through the ocean sediment floor. And this red plastic model here is just what it may have looked like. So the fossil itself is just this dark mark right here. So typically when you have fossils that get preserved, it's typically the hard body parts, such as if you think of dinosaurs, it's the dinosaur bones. With marine animals, it's usually the hard exoskeleton. But because these fossils are so well preserved, we actually get soft body preservation here. Now, let's get started with the highest points on the Great Divide Trail. So the highest point is an unnamed pass near Michelle Lakes. And this is the highest point right here. Here's Michelle Lakes. Now, why is the highest point here in a random mountain pass versus, say, not at the top of a peak, such as La Colette Peak? Well, there's a hint in this image. And if you look over here at Mount Wilson, we have this large area with a white color, which is actually the Wilson Ice Field. And if we zoom out, well, the highest point is located right over here, but one mountain range over is the Columbia Ice Field, which has some of the highest peaks in the Rockies, including Mount Columbia, the Twins, Mount King Edwards, Snow Dome. So we're right in the heart of the main ranges, which are the highest places in the Canadian Rockies. And we're also right in the heart of what the thickest part of the Rockies, where some of the highest peaks are. So this area has a naturally high elevation. So because of this naturally high elevation, it brings basically everything in here to a higher elevation than anywhere else in the Canadian Rockies besides Mount Robson. So a mountain pass here is at a higher elevation than any peaks in the Southern Canadian Rockies. Now, Moline Canyon is a pretty popular tourist spot in Jasper National Park, and it's very close to the Great Divide Trail. So I'd highly recommend doing it as either a side trip or if you take a zero day in Jasper to shoot off to Moline Canyon as it's quite beautiful. So the red line here is the Great Divide Trail. This is the end of the Skyline Trail. And you can take this quick trail over to Moline Canyon and walk down the trails and the bridges and then reconnect with the GDT over here. Now, the Moline Canyon itself is a slot canyon. And it's near the end of the Moline River, which is the outlet flow of Moline Lake and empties into the Athabasca River just off the picture over here. So the Moline Canyon is known as a karst topography, and this forms with carbonate rocks are dissolved by water. So examples of karst topography includes caves, which you can see in this image on the right here, sinkholes, the canyon itself, and karst environments are very common in the Canadian Rockies just due to the prevalent amount of carbonate rocks. And some famous examples include Castle Guard Cave in Banff National Park, Johnson Canyon Banff National Park, and Turbine Canyon in Kananaskis, with Turbine Canyon being very close to Turbine Canyon Campground, which is on the Great Divide Trail. Now, just to show you how common they are, this is the Cataract Pass cars, as I'm calling it. And I got this from this YouTube video from Rocky Mountain Scrambler. So what I want you to focus on is this dark area over here and this dark thing right here. So when you get closer to one of these, this is just the cave. So the 
the rocks here got dissolved away by this running water, creating these caves that now the water is flowing through and most likely out led somewhere else. So we have a karst here in Cataract Pass, and it just shows how calm they are just due to how many carbonate rocks are. Now back to Moline Canyon, the water comes from both surface runoff and underground caves that begin at Medicine Lake. So this picture on the right here is Medicine Lake. And the reason I like this uh, Google Earth image is you can actually see the currents of the Moline River it goes here, but then it stops. There's no outlet flow. You'd expect the outlet flow this way to continue down to Moline Canyon. However, what actually happens here is the water gets stuck and it sinks down into these underground caves and then reappears at the surface in Moline Canyon, such as a cave like this. So the water coming from this cave, most likely it comes from multiple sources. However, a large source of this is most likely Medicine Lake. Now the rock of the Moline Canyon is composed of the Palliser Formation, which was named after the Palliser Range, which was named after the Palliser Expedition. And the rock is Devonian in age, so 419 to 359 million years old. And it's quite a wide, the Palliser Formation has a very large extent in the Canadian Rockies, as you can see it from all the way to, from Crozenus Pass to Jasper. Now, if you ever get the chance, I'd highly recommend going to Moline Canyon in the winter as you can do ice walks down in the bottom, which I have done. It's great being down there. It's can't go all the way up here. You usually do it at the bottom of the canyon. Or another popular recreation activity is ice climbing. So I took this photo of a guy ice climbing and there was actually a lot of ice climbers the day I, I was here. So I'd highly recommend going in the winter over the summer as one, it's less busy. Two, you can actually go into the canyon itself. Now, Mount Robson, the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies, is 3,954 meters in elevation, or 12,972 feet. And Mount Robson is the end of Section F and the start of Section G on the Great Divide Trail. So why is Mount Robson so tall? Well, one, it's in the main ranges. So these peaks are just naturally higher than the other peaks in the front ranges or the back ranges. And two, as horizontal layers, which you can see in the, this image here. So horizontal layers are more resistant to erosion, just simply due to gravity. So imagine you pour some water on a table. The table's flat, water's just going to sit there and pool. But if you tilt the table like this, water will fall off. And it works the same way with rocks. If rocks have a steeper dip, the rocks will, are more likely to fall off, which will keep the mountains having a lower elevation. Whereas horizontal rocks, where they stay flat, they're more resistant to erosion, so they can stay higher. So an example of non-horizontal layers, this is in the front ranges east of Nordegg. Uh, not east of Nordegg, sorry, by Nordegg, east of the Great Divide Trail. And what I want you to focus on are these rock layers right here. As you can see, they're dipping this direction off to the west. So this red line's approximating it, but just imagine you're a rock on this side of the red line, you're going to fall off this way. First, if you're horizontal, you're just going to stay there. And obviously there's the steep side as well, which is even more aggressive for erosion. So why does Mount Robson have horizontal layers? Well, that's because Mount Robson is at the base of a large syncline. Now, a syncline is just a geological structure known as a fold, which you can see in this image down here. So they're using andiform and synform, which is the more general term, syncline and anticline means you know the age of the rocks. But an antiform forms in roughly an eight shape, but a synform forms pointing downwards in the opposite direction. So the sin form over here would be an example, say of Mount Robson, where if you look at this green layer, they're relatively horizontal, especially when compared to the arms of the folds here where they have quite steep dip. Now to show you the difference in the dip, so Mount Robson versus Resplendent Mountain. So this is Mount Robson right here and just off over here, hidden behind this mountain is Resplendent Mountain. Now I'm gonna pull it up on Google Earth so here's Mount Robson, which you can see has a noticeably higher elevation than Resplendent Mountain. However, if you look at the rock layers, you can see right here, nice and horizontal in Mount Robson. However, if you look at Resplendent Mountain, you can see that they're dipping even in this Google Earth image and they're approximately this dip. So because it's dipping, it's less resistant to erosion than Mount Robson, so it's at a lower elevation, even though they're relatively close to each other and you expect them to be closer in elevation. Now, I'm gonna go over some historical sites along the Great Divide Trail and how they relate to the geology. And much of the history in the Canadian Rocks is actually related to geology, specifically due to resource extraction, which played an important part of the history and development of the Rockies, and that includes the fur trade and mining. Now, the first historic site I want to talk about is House Pass. This is probably the most famous historic site along the Great Divide Trail. It's located in Section D. 
And it's it was used to connect North Saskatchewan drainage basin, specifically through House River, which you can see up here, with the Columbia River drainage basin through the Blayberry River. And it's used by the indigenous groups, especially the Kootenai, to gain access to the bison herds on the prairies east of the mountains. And it's first used by European and Canadian fur traders in 1807, when an expedition led by David Thompson for the Northwest Company crossed the pass to access Columbia River. And David Thompson's a very famous historical figure. He was the greatest land cartographer of all time and mapped out large, large areas of Canada. And his maps were still used until, I believe, the 1900s. And the funny thing is, though, even though he was the first European to use the pass, Joseph House, who was a worker for the Hudson's Bay Company at the time, is actually who the pass was named after. However, the House Pass itself fell to use to a Buchanan blockade on the pass to prevent David Thompson from trading with the Kootenai because they didn't want the Kootenai to get European guns, which led to the fur traders abandoning this pass in order. <clears throat> and they used Athabasca Pass farther to the north, now located in modern day Nash Jasper National Park. Now, Howes Pass is a natural historic site, so when you're there, you'll see this metal plaque put there by Parks Canada explaining the history of House Pass. And there's also this wooden sign up there, which uh, marks the first uh, crossing of House Pass by David Thompson. And they have to give him the title Mapmaker because he was a cartographer. Now, Frank Slide is another famous site within Alberta, also close to the Great Divide Trail. It's just east of it. And it was a massive landslide that occurred in 1903, where 110 million tons of rock fell off of Turtle Mountain, which you can see in this image here. This is Turtle Mountain, and this is the landslide debris, all these loose rock, which actually crosses Crow's Nest Highway and the railway. You can see one person over here. So some of these rocks are massive. But I believe the largest I saw when I've been there before was a rock roughly the size of the house. And it was the deadliest landslide in Canadian history as it buried part of the town of Frank, and it resulted in 70 to 90 casualties. So not really known how many people actually passed away in the slide. And there was multiple causes. Well, it's thought there was multiple causes for the slide, such as Turtle Mountain anticline. So Turtle Mountain is in an anticline, which is the A shape, so inherently unstable because of the uh, steep dip on the folds. Uh, coal mining in Turtle Mountain itself may cause instability, and it was a wet winter that year. And after, I believe it was the snow was melting, and there was a large cold snap after that. So just due to frost heaving, when water freezes, it expands when it turns to ice. So that could have caused just large cracks to form. Plus, the Blackfoot and Cooney both have oral traditions uh, refer to Turtle Mountain as the mountain that moves. So that should have been a warning sign before they started digging for coal in there. And another interesting fact that to this day, the Alberta Geologic Survey has monitors up on the peak to record potential landslide hazards. And just to show you where Frank's slide is relative to the, to the Great Divide Trail, here's the Great Divide Trail here going into Coleman. It's just to the east of it right here where you can see the landslide. So you'll be walking just west on this ridge over here. You'll be able to see the backside of Turtle Mountain, so the side that doesn't have the landslide scar. Now, I'm gonna talk about a couple of mine sites that are located on the Great Divide Trail. First one I'm going to discuss is Galena Miracle Mine because the Great Divide Trail actually uses part of the old mine access road, specifically right here. You can see the old mine access road up here and the Great Divide Trail intersects it right here. Now, Galena Miracle Mine is located on Mount Gas next to the High Rock Trail of the GDT and it's what's known as carbonate hosted lead sink deposit. So the metals that were mined here were lead, zinc, and silver and these metals were deposited in these carbonate rocks by hydrothermal fluid so hot water and the main minerals that were mined here were galena and sphalerite which is a lead sulfide and a zinc sulfide now the red circle located right here this is old man slash memory lake campsite so you can camp quite close and it could do a quick side trip up to galena miracle mine if you wanted to and sadly i couldn't find what years this mine was active so if anyone knows that i'd love to know it and the second mine I'm going to talk about is Monarch Mine, which is located in the middle of Yoho National Park, very close to Field. And this was also another carbonate hosted lead zinc deposit, and large amounts of lead, zinc, and silver were mined here. And the mine audits themselves are located on Mount Stephen and Mount Field. And you can actually see them from the Trans Canada Highway. And you can see a foot mine audit here, mine audit here, another one here, and there's quite a few ones up here. 
So mining at this mine was active from 1935 to 1952. And what's interesting with this was Yoho National Park was established in 1886. So it shows how much Parks Canada has changed throughout the years, where back in the past, active mining was initially allowed in, within the national parks. However, now it's all protected in the environment, so you could, would never be allowed to do this. Now, if any of this interested you, uh, I have a few books to recommend. So Geology, Canadian Rockies Geology Road Tours by Ben Gad. You can access geologic reports and maps from Geologic Survey of Canada, Alberta Geologic Survey, or British Columbia Geologic Survey. Uh, glaciers of Canadian Rockies, if you're interested in the glaciers, it's just a list of all the different glaciers, and that's from the United States Geologic Survey. Then I can show you this website after as well, macrostrat.org. It's just, it works like Google Earth, you can zoom in and zoom out, but it'll show the different geologic formations that at least they have in their database. Then for some of the history, I'd recommend the writings of David Thompson, Volume 2, as that's when David Thompson traveled through House Pass and Athabasca Pass. The Company, The Rise and Fall of Hudson's Bay Empire by Stephen R. Brown, same thing. It's just show, talks about how the fur traders explored the Rockies. Then history of the Great Divide Trail on the Great Divide Trail Association's website under Discover the GDT. Thank you all for listening and thank you to the Great Divide Trail Association for hosting this presentation. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Connor. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to pop them up in our Q&A and uh, Connor can go ahead and get to them. I know yeah, we sorry, do have just, one question. Yeah, take your time. We have yeah, one I'm question just, in there. Yeah, I just need to stop you. sharing my screen so I can see mm -hmm. the questions. I'll, I'll pull the presentation off if it relates to the presentation. So one Q&A? Yeah, I think there was one in there. Uh, technically, yes, there's still, I mean, like it won't cause any major problems. Like there was recently, I believe it was last year, two years ago, there was an earthquake that was felt in Banff. Uh, can't remember what thrust fault caused it. It was a relatively low magnitude, but people felt it shaking, I believe in Banff and Canmore. I'll, uh, I'll quickly look it up actually, just to see what year it was. But nothing uh, that would cause any serious issues and really they're not, yeah, 2021, 4.4 magnitude earthquake. So, but really the thrust faults won't be moving anymore just because mountain building has stopped in that region. The mountain building now in Canada is located on the coast mountains. So on the very edge of British Columbia. So. All right, any more questions? Oh, we have a chat. Oh, here we go. I believe Galena Mine was active until the 1940s. I've been in the old audit. Interesting place. Oh. <laughs> hmm. All right. Well, if that <clears throat> that's all, anything else you want to say, Connor? Oh, here we go. Uh, here if you have any other questions even if it's not geology related i i do live in calgary so whether it's uh has to do with just general hiking trails or conditions or any recommendations i'll answer those as well yeah we also have one another question ah when do the western ranges get renamed the back ranges and by who and why uh i've seen them name both western ranges and back ranges don't know by who and why, sorry about that. But they also are called the Western Ranges. I should have mentioned that. What are the common formations in section B? Ooh, so I can pull that up. Let me pull up macrostrat.org. I'll start sharing my screen soon. So the Palliser formation is a pretty common one. I believe the Cadman formation as well. Uh, which the Cadman formation is uh, conglomerate, if I remember correctly. Sorry, I just got you. Here, I'll start sharing my screen. So this is how Macrostrap works. It works similar to Google Earth, and then you can just zoom in. So I'll zoom into section B. So it starts off pretty large scale. Uh, let's 
click on this orange color here, and this shows the Pascapu formation, which gives the age dates. We'll give some references, I believe. Uh, yeah, right here, source, get age, and there will be other lots of information it will give. However, the more you zoom in, the more detailed it will get. So there's Fernie. Sorry, being a bit slow, but here we go. Here's section B. So how about we head to where Glena Miracle Mine is actually located. I believe this is where the High Rock Trail is. So for example, if you click one of these peaks right here, this is the Livingstone Formation, Limestone and Dollstone, so carbonates. If you click this right here, the slightly different color, Etherton Formation, Dollstone, Limestone, Chert, Sandstone, Shale, Siltstone. So lots of the times these formations will have different rock types. Trying to find where Mount Gas is or say Big Beehive. Let's see. Belly River Group, that's another pretty common one. I know the Palliser is located here as well. Maybe it's this blue one. For any formation, that's a pretty common one. Ah, here's Mount Gas right here. So this would be where the mine is located, the Livingston Formation, Mount Head Formation, Eddington Formation. Rocky Mountain Super Group, that uh, groups just mean that they have multiple form formations in it. So I'd highly recommend just looking around. Blairmore Group, that's another pretty common one. I'd highly recommend if you want to learn more about these formations, pulling up Macrostat, and then you can also go to anywhere in the Great Divide Trail. So I'll jump up to Section C quickly. Like another pretty common one is the Gog Group in the main ranges. Uh, that's reason it's common it's a very large sandstone unit so like mount edith cavill in jasper national park i believe is mostly made out of the god group but hopefully that answers your questions yeah we just have a question um about the flooding on berg lake trail um so this is yeah so the flooding berg lake trail is closed it doesn't affect the gdt other than you can't use Mount Robson or Berg Lake as a resupply. Yeah, I believe so, the Berg Lake Trail is only open to Kenny Lake, if I remember correctly. There, yeah. the plan, at least BC Parks plan, I believe 2025 is when they want yeah. to reopen the whole trail. But let's see if that actually happens. Hopefully, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, there's no delays. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So just the, there's a moose alternate um, to exit out. Uh, before uh, Section G or Blueberry Lake Trailhead. And this information is on the uh, GDT A website. Um, but yeah, you can just, you just can't resupply at Berg Lake anymore. You kind of skirt the back of Mount Robson Park. You don't actually have to go in. Okay. And uh, just a question about the Burgess Shale. Burgess Shale, yeah, sure. <laughs> ah, I did have that in my notes. I forgot to mention that. Do not take those fossils. They are protected. You will get massive fines if you're caught with them. Leave them where they are. Like, if you see it, you can look at it. You pick it up to take a better look, but put it back down. Thank you for mentioning that. I completely forgot. Yeah. Okay. And just rocks. in the <clears throat> Yeah, I saw that. The metamorphic rocks. So the Gog group is there's quite abundant metamorphic rocks in that. Metamorphic rocks are common in that Canadian the Rockies. There are some in the western Rockies, like before you get to the Rocky Mountain trench, because it that's just more intensive, higher pressure mound building. Like as you go west, the pressure and the temperature increased during the mountain building phase. So really lot, mo lots of metamorphic rocks are actually located in British Columbia, like in the Columbia mountains. But I'd highly recommend, at least in the Canadian Rockies, the Gog group because quartzite's quite common. So if anyone's been to Lake Louise, there's these big cliffs at the backside of Lake Louise that are really popular with rock climbing. And that's the Gog group quartzite. So the Gaw group also has sandstone and I believe some siltstone and shale as well, and maybe some limestone or dollstone. 
but yeah, the quartzite, how that formed is it originally was a sandstone, but the cement got what's called silicified. So it basically turned into quartz. So it makes the rock really hard. So that's why it's very good for rock climbing and why it's also now called quartzite. Now, there's also volcanic rocks in the Canadian Rockies, too. I can also discuss about that. I'm going to include my email. Was it on the presentation? I can't remember. I can't remember. Do you, if you want yeah. to put your email in the chat? Yeah, sure. I'll put it in the chat. Hmm. Talk about volcanic rocks. Okay, I'll quickly put in my email. So volcanic rocks aren't super common, but there is the crow's nest volcanics, which they were a weird chemistry rock. I can't remember the exact type of rock, but what's really special about them is they have these garnets in them. So garnets usually aren't all in volcanic rocks, but they're also a different color. They're black garnets. So people really like those black garnets. In the crow's nest volcanics, then there's a few igneous dikes located randomly throughout the park. Like I believe there's one on Yellowhead Pass, there's one along the Icefields Parkway. And basically what a igneous dike is, it's just igneous rock that cross cut the surrounding layers. And they could be a variety of compositions. Then there's also the Ice River Carbonatite Complex, which half of it's located in Yoho National Park, the other half's outside of it. And carbonatites are weird because basically, typically lava and magma forms from sil silicate rocks. So how that works is SiO4, so silicon, and then for oxygen, but carbonatite rocks form from carbonates. So they have very weird chemistry, like many of the rare earth element deposits on the planet come from carbonatites. And I know, I believe that's what they're looking at at the Ice River Complex outside of Yoho National Park. And then we have a Q&A on formations contain fossils. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> and basically any of the carbonate formations could contain fossils. Like I did a backpacking trip at Lake Minnewanka in Banff and there was just a random boulder, one of the dry creek beds that was full of snail fossils. Uh, obviously the Stephen Formation, which is where the British Shale is. I believe the Cathedral Formation has fossils. Uh, hold on, there's, there's Coral Pass, which is one of the alternates on the Great Divide Trail has fossils, but I don't remember what formation that is and and it's coral fossils so <laughs> passes aptly name but then there's also fossil mountain in by the skokie area of lake louise i'm just blanking on what formation that is and there's also brachiopod mountain named after the brachiopods sorry i'm just looking on ah it just says devonian in age it doesn't give the actual formation on MacroStrat. I'm sorry about that, but well, let's head to, yeah, basically, if you take enough time, look in the carbonate rocks, you'll most likely find a fossil, but maybe it'll just be one, maybe it'll be a fossil bed. Uh, one easy way, like you're not supposed to use color, but lots of the carbonate rocks in the Canadian Rockies are gray. So if you see a gray rock that looks relatively solid, I, you can take a quick look. Just trying to find where coral passes over here on MacroStrat to see what formation it is. Is this it here? Ah, here it is here, I'm pretty sure. Opal and Carnarvon members. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I believe that's a doll stone has fossils in it. I think that's coral pass. Yeah, and if you want to look for fossils, I'd highly recommend uh, stream beds that are very rocky because lots of the times the rocks will get washed away from higher up or higher, farther upstream. And that's pretty, I found a lot of fossils that way, just even just in stream beds. All right. But if you're in the national parks, don't take them. <laughs> yes, I do know a story of a CEO or a park warden chasing someone who stole fossils up a mountain and he did yeah. get them 
Yeah. Oh, even if you escape with the fossils, they will track you down. There was one, uh, <laughs> someone in Kootenai National Park took a bunch of Burgess Shale fossils from, not not the one in Yoho, there's different uh, Burgess Shale fossil deposits scattered. In, I believe there's two or three in Yoho, two in Yoho for sure, then I think two, two or three in Kootenai. And I believe there's one in Banff actually too, but one of the ones in Kootenai, someone stole a bunch of fossils and then had to pay a massive fine. Yes. Um, what was the crow's nest volcanic formation called? I will quickly look that up. Crow's nest formation. And I believe, I'm trying to remember the rock that actually forms it. Like there's different types of rocks, but one that's blamorite is like uh, a type of locality rock that's located there just due to the abundance of not common volcanic minerals. I believe it's when I've seen it before, it was just road outcrops uh, along the Crossness Highway. I, I don't remember if it was in BC or Alberta though. Uh, how fossils work on crown lands, it's technically you can collect it, but it's always owned by the crown. So it's always owned by the government of Alberta. So. All right, guys. Well, if that's it for tonight, um, thanks, Connor, so much. That was a lovely presentation. And. Thanks yeah, everyone for I listening. Think, yeah. yeah, thanks for listening. And yeah, if you have any more questions, um, make sure you have Connor's email. You can also contact the GDTA. And yeah, we will see you guys all soon, hopefully.